Hi all, welcome to the Web Doctor webinar. Great to have you all here. So um, in terms of Web Doctor, who are we and, and who am I? So a quick introduction to myself, I'm Joe Hinn. I've been part of Medihive, which is um, the parent company of Web Doctor for the last um, 18 months. And it's been brilliant for me personally to see the, the companies and the employees that we've been able to help within the likes of Tesco and the Bank of Ireland. In terms of broader web doctor. So for those of you that don't know, um, we're a corporate care provider offering the Irish population virtual health care. In terms of our background, um, our award-winning online doctor service provides Irish employees and their families the ability to undertake consultation at the comfort of their own home or, or office. I mean, I could talk about web doctor all day, and um, we're conscious of the time that we have, so um, we'll make a swift start. However, if you or your company are keen to find out more, there'll be information provided in terms of in emails or websites that you can get in touch. I'll be more than happy to address any further questions that you have. But without further ado, let's get into the, the crux of why we're all here and um, ultimately address the, the big taboo around workplace well-being. So I am pleased to let you know that I'm joined um, by Dr. Christina Mulvaney. Um, Dr. Christina, do you want to give a, the audience a quick introduction to yourself? Well, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, I'm just one of the doctors that does work with webdoctor.ie. Um, I've been working them with them almost six years, and um, I would participate in these kind of uh, events as well for them a little bit as well. Brilliant. Thanks for the intro, um, Christina. So, I mean, let's dive straight in. Dr. Christina, um, well-being is a term that a lot of people interpret differently. What would be your take on it? Uh, it's a very complex term, isn't it? <laughs> um, but realistically, I suppose a well-being is a state of being healthy and happy. I suppose overall, there's that kind of physical and mental health kind of point of view, to, uh, point of view from both of those things. So I suppose a state of being happy and healthy overall. And I suppose that encompasses being happy and healthy at work and home in all aspects of your life. So not just in one place. Um, it's, the I suppose, the mental and physical aspects of being in, in, in a good mental place and physical physical place as well. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Um, so considering that point, I mean, what would you recommend if someone's struggling? Occupational health, what, what sort of the stage in which someone would know when to go and when to address these things? to get seen yeah so i suppose i feel like it does boil down a lot to what the problem is so um say this is a physical thing maybe somebody had a hip replacement or some sort of operation you know everything has like an expected uh a timeline with which we would expect things to improve. Actually, even social welfare, when we're doing social welfare certs, um, we have to put a code in to explain what the problem is or give an idea of what the problem is. And social welfare expect, oh, we put down anxiety, they should be back in about two weeks, or we put down a uh, hip replacement, okay, that's gonna take a little bit longer. So it, it, it does boil down to what the actual problem is is um so i mean if somebody was out for a hip replacement i wouldn't be surprised if it took them six or eight weeks to kind of fully recover and be able to return and i guess it also depends on the occupation that they have right because if maybe they can sit in a chair rather than have to lift bricks and mortar and stuff like that they might be able to get back to things faster so it is a complex that is a very complex question but i suppose the time I think those are kind of obvious ones, you know, when we're thinking about kind of being out for uh, um, uh, post-op or um, a fracture or any of those types of things. Um, the ones that get complicated and probably the ones that cause people the most confusion in uh, an occupational health point of view is when we see people and we don't know why they're out maybe, <laughs> or we don't know uh, they're out longer than you would expect. So we have somebody out, well, maybe post-op uh, from a hip replacement three months. And you're like, well, why are you out three months? Like everybody else would have been back in six or eight weeks. So when things are kind of boiling down to either a known amount of time that normally people would expect and they're kind of starting to flow over and i would say 
I would nip that probably in the bud relatively quickly, like maybe leave it a week or two if there's some sort of understandable reason and then kind of say, okay, well, like normally we would have been back at the stage. Is there anything we can do? Maybe send you to the occupational health doctor to see if they can give us anything to help you facilitate you getting back to work. But then when it's not something that you know why they are off, because you're not always going to know, because even on the certs that we have, we used to write uh, so-and-so is out due to tonsillitis, right? And we've been told, no, don't do that anymore. Write down medical illness. <laughs> so you're very much in the dark. So if you don't know, I would actually even peel it back to as soon as you're kind of like questioning, mm, this doesn't seem 100%, I would kind of be going relatively quickly into that, like a week or two, because I've seen, and actually there's a woman that comes off the top of my head. Um, like I had a lady in, uh, it was May of 23, and yeah. she didn't actually end up seeing the occupational health doctor until February of 24. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of shocked that they wouldn't have sent her like way before that. Like I was seeing her from a GP perspective in my own practice, but like, I, I kept saying like, are they not going to bring you to occupational health? And it wasn't even coming up in the conversation. And they eventually actually did send her and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I was really kind of surprised that they waited so, so long. And I almost felt like it was them trying to avoid the issue and hope it was going to get better. And I'm like, mm, I don't know that that's going <laughs> to happen really. And I can't obviously call the employer and be like, hey, I think you should do this. But yeah, I think um, if, 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 the management department is thinking what we don't understand why this person's off and they've been off either too long or they have no idea why i would suggest get seen as soon as possible oh and particularly and actually that was the case in this person's uh, case if you think you maybe are the reason why <laughs> they're off as well yeah. like workplace anxiety and stuff like that i would i would send them to occupational health um sooner rather than later just because i think it's good to have that network in yeah, and it's obviously I think I think you mentioned it there, um, Christina, around I think the physical side of things, but the anxiety and I mean that can be can be difficult at times. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that will continue to go to work who are struggling mentally, um, just to sort of try and brush it under the rug. In that sort of scenario, what I mean, what can employees really do to try and tease that out to help their staff to go to um, the resource that's there? yeah well i suppose i'm and even i suppose sometimes people want to know in a remote setting about these types of things like if you see things changing in people's behavior that's how gonna be kind of red alerts like they're missing deadlines not going doing their work to the potential that they were doing before making kind of errors and slip-ups that normally would have never seen or coming into late late into work or leaving yeah. early and you know those kind of obvious things where you're like mm, they're either not paying attention or they don't care anymore <laughs> one or the other it seems to be going on those are kind of big red uh flags and it could be because maybe they are anxious but that also happens when you're physically unable to do things anymore too maybe they're in a lot of pain because of x problem they're not telling you what the problem is but that's affecting them um so i think yeah big red flags is changing like kind of their workplace behavior which uh, would trigger you to kind of be like, oh, I was just wondering, I noticed that you maybe are struggling a little bit recently. Is there anything you think I could do to help? By the way, we have X program available for you and this is how you can reach out to them if this is something that you would be interested in. Brilliant, no, it's, it's really great to get your, your take on that. So I know, I think one of the personal challenges for me is often even if I do think there's a problem, um, getting to the GP, I mean, personally, it's quite difficult to access a GP, you have to get up really early in the morning to call and then you're usually too late to make an appointment or it just can be quite a tedious and long process, which I know isn't good, um, but I'll admittedly say that that's something I struggle with. But what well, I have to say... Sorry, go ahead. I was no, like, I was just going to say we do have a great uh, a great setup. So um, even comparing myself on Web Doctor versus my own office, <laughs> um, getting appointments um, with Web Doctor tends to be uh, extremely fast, and most offices actually are uh, not able to compare to the, the quickness that you're able to get an appointment. So you can literally be lying in your bed, go on the app, fill out the questions, and get an appointment. And if you're lucky, you might actually even get it right away i've seen people literally log on and have an appointment like within 10 minutes so it can be that quickly but 
you know, frequently it's within a day or so. Um, and a lot of offices, like I've actually spoken to some patients and they were like, I called my GP, they won't get me an appointment for four to six weeks. <laughs> that is not becoming uh, uncommon. That's actually, uh, uh, sadly, very common. Um, but then the other advantage is, you know, like you could, if you wanted to go to work, right? And step out for 10 minutes and have your consultation and go rather than like you said having to go to the office sit in the waiting room wait for ages um we're pretty good about i have to say time timekeeping on web doctor because there's kind of good rules associated with the uh, consultations and stuff like that so uh you know you're not waiting 45 minutes after your scheduled appointment because everything's fallen behind or anything like that so yeah you could be at work in a nice like private quiet place or you could be in um in your home and yeah there's no no sitting around catching anything from anybody else um there's a lot of advantages to uh to using our um webdoctor.ie amazing christina thank you for sharing that and um, i think broader from a patient or employee staff perspective what effect do you think visiting the GP early um, does actually have on recovery time, if there is to be yes. an issue? Well, even if we think of something simple like tonsillitis, right? Um, so you're, you know, if you're told that you're going to wait for six weeks, you're going to have to suffer through it by the sounds of things. But um, uh, yeah, you're going to be recovered by the time you get seen. Um, but uh, with regard to, say, like being able to get in touch with Web Doctor, um, if you got seen in the first couple of days, they see that you have tonsillitis, we start you on antibiotics, you're going to start getting the medicine that you need to recover faster, you're going to have your energy back faster, you're going to feel less pain faster, you're going to just feel better faster because you got the right treatment earlier in the course of illness and we'll, yeah you'll recover in a more quick fashion yeah and i think ultimately that will have a net effect on absenteeism um Ooh, over yeah. time yeah yeah 100 percent. because i suppose like even if you think about that you would think normally maybe three days somebody might be out for something like a tonsillitis maybe maximum five but three to five days somewhere in that uh range and yeah if they've gotten worse they're gonna start that number is going to probably push up even more. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. No, thank you for sharing your take on that. Um, so telltale signs when someone is dealing with mental or physical illness, and I think you touched on this um, before, but a lot of people are in remote roles now. So what is sort of what should one be looking out for? Uh, and particularly even from the other end of it. So obviously I speak to a lot of my colleagues remotely what are some of the things i can potentially look out for in my colleagues as well yeah well i suppose it kind of i feel it's similar ish to being in the office i know it's a little bit harder because you're not with those people all day every day and then obviously you're not going to be able to go down for lunch with them and do things like that which does give you added periods of time that you're able to kind of interact and and suss things out but i suppose really changes in your work performance say if you were in a meeting say something like this and somebody's normally relatively chatty and maybe they don't chat at all or they chat very little little or maybe they turn off their screen you know changes yeah. in their behavior of how they're uh changes in how they're acting out of the ordinary now i mean obviously people can have a bad day so i wouldn't just kind of jump onto it at the first thing and be like oh yeah joe didn't say a word during that meeting <laughs> um uh he he had something wrong with him i you'd, you'd probably observe it over a period of time and i suppose it wouldn't just be in a meeting setting either like i was saying if their work production has changed as well or they're making mistakes where they ne previously never would have made mistakes those would be other kind of red flags to say maybe we should have a little meeting and just check in on them and see how how are they doing no brilliant i think it's that's one thing that i think a lot of us need to get better at things again especially in a remote setting you go from one meeting to the next and i think sometimes you lose that 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 personal that that uh, interaction so no it's really great to get your take on that and then yeah just to really to end off i think we can all do a lot more um to prioritize our well-being what would be the four, four, a few points of advice um that you'd give um to really for people to really consider well, I think making time for ourselves, uh, that's a big problem. A lot of people, I, I feel a lot of people, or a conversation that I have with people a lot is taking care of themselves. They always are talking about what they're doing for other people and there's never any uh, time 
for them. Um, prioritizing that time is really important. One way I usually explain it to people is I say, like, think of like your day in a hundred units of uh, energy, <laughs> and you have to kind of give those units of energy to different things. And if you're putting it all into, you know, eighty percent work, and they have twenty percent left, like for family, you have to balance these things. You have to balance these things out. So I think really looking at time and uh, I I know like I suppose even with work like people you know you go there for a reason you're making money and stuff like that for your family and sometimes that ends up being it like people are working too much because they're trying to make men ends meet and stuff like that but the problem is is if you don't get that balance it, it throws things off greatly um and and you do end up getting burned out and then then you're no good to anybody um so i think making sure that people are conscious of like their mental health and taking time to you know i really would hope and they do somewhat do it in primary school and secondary school now where they work on like mindfulness and meditation and cognitive behavioral therapy. I think those probably have sounded like very gimmicky words for a lot of uh, time with people. Um, but I think that they uh, are very, very important things that we should probably have scheduled in our life, maybe for even 15 minutes, half an hour. Actually, that even makes me think uh, so much so that there was a conference, a cardiology conference in the US recently, and they showed that if you, for 15 minutes twice a day, just closed your eyes, lie down, say on the couch or something like that, um, and said nice things to yourself, like today is gonna be a good day, everything's gonna be all right, things like that. Just do that 15 minutes twice a day. They said that that was, uh, they shot, saw improvement within 21 days, equivalent to a blood pressure wow. tablet. So even doing those little, little simple things can have a massive, massive effect on us. And I mean, I think they obviously have proven, um, uh, they have proven that that will uh, help. Um, but I think it helps a lot more than that <laughs> myself, you know, uh, that's only one, that's the only thing that they proved. Um, so yeah, taking time and uh, for yourself mentally and physically, obviously exercise is really, really important. And then like having time for your family and work. Yeah, it's just making sure that you literally schedule because well, life is too busy and you lose track of time and then the day's gone, but literally schedule those things and that should help, I would think, yeah. I really love that analogy about the units of energy. Um, mm -hmm. I think in life, we, as I say, you have money or you have time, which is all measured in units, and we don't necessarily do that with energy. So I really, really love that analogy. I'll um, I'll definitely take that one for myself. So, I'll use uh, it for sickness too. Because <laughs> uh, I'll be like, yeah, when you have tonsillitis, say, you know, and they'll be like, yeah, I'm so tired and I don't have any energy to do things. I'm like, it's because your body's just stolen all this energy to fix the problem. So you have no choice where that's going. <laughs> so that's to be expected. And if you don't give it that and you go, you know, decide to run a marathon and you steal that energy back, you're going to be sick for longer, which makes, I think it kind of helps you think about those things like that. Yeah, it's really important to kind of, uh, that, that I, I like to make things simple. <laughs> no yeah, for sure I'm, and I'm, that's definitely perspective that i i definitely needed so yeah no that that's fantastic so um no it's been really great to hear your thoughts on such relevant topics um and i'll open the floor um up for for q a hey yeah, guys so we have a couple of questions so managing work-life balance is something that we can all struggle with at times do you have any tips yeah, I think it's more making a schedule, I suppose, is really it. I mean, yeah, I would say making a schedule and saying, like, I need to spend half an hour a day on my mental health, maybe half an hour at least a day on my physical health, so some sort of physical activity. If you can combine those two things, maybe, and do an hour of both, maybe something that does the two together for you, um, fantastic. But, like, at least kind of prioritizing those two items and then kind of, you know, that's, I don't think it's a lot to ask of an hour a day for yourself <laughs> um, to keep yourself on track. And I think those would probably, making it kind of a schedule and saying I have to do, and making it that you have to, you know, uh, you're obviously your own boss with regard to that time, but make it that you are like, I, I must complete this task every single day and it's for me so I can keep myself in a good place and be there for others and my, my friends, my family and my uh, work colleagues. That's brilliant. So kind of making it your non-negotiable for yourself to kind of 100%. Okay, brilliant. Definitely take some of that advice. Um, 
and then we just have one more uh christina so how can we help or encourage um employees to be more proactive about their health to avoid absenteeism well, I suppose one thing that would help a lot is even being having access to the doctor quicker, to be honest, like uh, that. I mean, like uh, Joan was saying, like thinking about the idea of having to book the appointment, told that it's going to be a while away, going to the office, all that. If you can take that hassle out of the problem and just have to go to your phone, go on an app, book an appointment, get on when when it suits you as well, because you get the choice of times and do it in a location that suits you as well. You don't have to travel to a specific place. I think making it less complicated and easier um, to access the doctor, that will take a lot of the struggle away. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's everything. Unless anyone else has any questions, I'll just open, open it up. No, I think we're all good. Thank you so much, Christina. That's it from, from the admin side. Thank you very much, guys. That was great.